And uh, the gallop then goes on to continue a little later. The question therefore remains unanswered. Who was the customer who ordered the counterfeit bonds? Based on all the available evidence, all the available official evidence, it is possible to draw only two conclusions. Each is bizarre. One is that Leopold Ladle and Mario Fellini were planning to steal from the American mafia a huge fortune in counterfeit bonds, having first conned the mafia into going to the very considerable expense of creating the bonds. This particular section of the mafia had a number of members who killed or maimed people whom they merely imagined had insulted them. If this is the real reason, then Ladle and Fellini were seeking an unusual form of suicide. The other conclusion is that the $950 million of counterfeit bonds were destined for the Vatican. So basically what we have here is a huge, huge counterfeit bond scheme set up uh, apparently apparently in conjunction with the Vatican by the American Mafia, and basically all parties were going to profit. The Vatican was going to wind up with a billion dollars in phony securities, which were then negotiable, according to one man, to buy out a legitimate business operation. And it's worth noting that the Mafia was going to make a lot of money. A lot of people were going to make a lot of money. And uh, note Bishop Marchinkus's claims of innocence, and also how uh, he seemed remarkably unable to get himself involved in uh, an official capacity in hunting down these securities. And, uh, uh, yeah, not to mention the fact made by Yallop that it was interesting that he should choose to have dealings with, uh, with Fellini in the first place after the man had already been involved uh, and was known to have been involved in a couple of schemes of counterfeit bond laundering. And one would wonder why anybody would contract for a financial relationship with somebody like that unless you specifically wanted to get counterfeit bonds laundered. Anyway, as the, the allegations by Fellini and, and Ladle suggested that, um, that the perp part of the purpose for this bond scheme was to enable Sendona through the Vatican Bank to get his hands on enough money to buy out Bastogi, a very large corporation, and uh, apparently this fell through. Now, as we're going to see in just a moment, um, uh, at this juncture, Sendona decided to start, manu man start moving his maneuvers after the Bastogi frustration and the fall through of the counterfeit bond scheme into the United States. But first, we're going to set up a little general stuff about Sendona's business empire, again reading from In God's Name. Fina Bank was also part of a giant laundry for Mafia P2 criminal money. With the Vatican retaining a 5% share of Societa Generale Immobiliare, uh, it owned part of that laundry. With the further use by the Mafia of the Vatican Bank to move money both into and out of Italy, the Vatican ultimately owned the entire laundry. Use by Sindona and his staff of the Vatican Bank's accounts at BPF has already been explained. That's the Banca Privata Finanzi Finanziaria. Has already been explained. That was one of the methods of getting dirty money out of the country and cleaning it at Fina Bank. But this was a two-way operation. Dirty money from the Mafia, operating in Mexico, Canada, and the United States, was also being cleaned as it flowed into Italy. The operation was very simple. To quote again from Carlo Bordoni's de deposition to the Milan magistrates, quote, These companies in Canada and Mexico were used to bring into the USA over the Canadian and Mexican borders dollars from the Mafia, from the Freemasons, and from numerous illegal and criminal operations. The money arrived in suitcases and was then invested in U.S. state bonds. These were then sent to Finabank, clean and easily negotiable. Unquote. The American Mafia obviously had no problems with borders. Their money was converted to bonds directly by Edil Centro or Edil Centro of Washington, a subsidiary of Omi Om Immobiliare that, among other things, built the Watergate apartment complex. Then the bonds also found their way to Finabank. If the Mafia wished to bring some of their clean money into Italy, they used Vatican Bank channels. In the early 1970s, Sindona extolled his own virtues to Bordoni. Quote, My operating philosophy is based on my personality, which is unique in the world, on well-told lies, and on the efficient weapon of blackmail. Unquote. Again, remember Licio Jelly, who also relied on blackmail. Part of the blackmail technique was to bribe. A bribe, in Sindona's view, was, quote, merely an investment. It gave you a hold over the individual bribed. Thus, he unofficially financed the ruling Italian political party, the Christian Democrat, Democrat, Democrats. Two billion lira to ensure the promotion of party nominee Mario Baroni to the position of managing director of Banca di Roma. Eleven billion lira to finance the party's campaign against the divorce referendum. He arranged for the Christian Democrats to, quote, earn billions of dollars. He opened an account for the party at Finabank, account SIDC. Throughout the early 1970s, $750,000 was regularly transferred to this account. 
Sindona, the self-proclaimed hero of anti-communism, was also a man to hedge his bets. He opened another account at Finabank for the Italian Communist Party. Into this, he also poured 750000 per month of other people's money. And that account number was SICO. He speculated against the lira, the dollar, the German mark, and the Swiss franc. With, regards to his, with regard to his massive speculation against the lira, a $650 million operation entirely created by Sindona, he told Prime Minister Andreotti of Italy that he was aware of the existence of heavy speculation against the lira and that in order to learn more about the size of the operation and the source, he had instructed Bordoni through Money Rex, another company, to join in a, quote, symbolic manner. Having reaped enormous profits by attacking the lira, he was hailed by Andriotti as, quote, the savior of the lira. It was during this period that he received a citation presented by the American ambassador to Rome, John Volpe, Man of the Year for 1973. Okay. Continuing now with In God's Name by David Yallop. Thwarted in his attempt to take over Bastogi, the large Milanese holding company by the Italian establishment, who were motivated partly by fear of an increasingly powerful Sindona and partly by prejudice against a Sicilian, the shark turned his attention to the United States. There, this man, who already owned more banks than many men do shirts, bought another bank, the Franklin National Bank in New York. Franklin National was the 20th, 20th largest bank in the country. Sindona paid $40 million for 1 million shares in it, representing a 21.6% interest. He paid $40 per share at a time when the share price was $32. More important, this time he had bought a very sick bank. Unbeknownst to Sindona, Franklin National was tottering on the very edge of bankruptcy. The true megalomania of Sindona can be gauged from the fact that, when he realized what he had acquired, he didn't give a damn. To him, dealing with tottering banks was an everyday event as long as huge deposits could be kept whirling around on paper. As long as the telex machine was there to transfer A to B and then to C and then back to A again. Within 24 hours of his purchase and before... Uh, did it again. Before he had even had an opportunity to try out the boardroom for size, Franklin National announced its trading figures for the second quarter of 1972. These showed a 28% drop from the same period for 1971. Sindona the Shark, the savior of the lira and the man Marchink is considered to be well ahead of his time as far as banking matters are concerned, took the news in a typical Sindona fashion. I have important connections in all important financial centers. Those who do business with McKaylee Sindona will do business with Franklin National, unquote. The previous owners, meanwhile, were laughing all the way to another bank. So McKaylee Sindona now moving his banking empire into the United States Acquiring the Franklin National Bank, not a very good purchase under the circumstances. Okay, and before we get further into the fall of the Franklin National and, as it was called in Italy, Il Crack Sindona, the Sindona Crack, the, uh, the scandal that basically started the, uh, the long avalanche um, that uh, wound up with Michele Sindona uh, eating poison and dying in, a, in, a, in an Italian women's prison, which we will get to later on in the broadcast, uh, we're going to take another short break. So I'll give you all a chance to get up and stretch the legs and stuff like that there. All righty? Okay, good. We'll be back in about five or six minutes. Okay, we'd like to hear from uh, our phone screener, Jim, uh, if he's uh, in a position to give us a call. It'll be important. Okay. And uh, once again, we will be back in just a few moments with more of Radio Free America, the Mediterranean merry-go-round. And until that time, you can all take it easy. We'll be back. Broadcasting from Foothill College, this is KFJC, Los Altos Hills. <laughs> And we are back. This is Nip Tuck in the studios with Dave Emery at KFJC, ready to continue with part two of our Radio Free America special on the Mediterranean merry-go-round, the incredible tom uh, complex tangle of international events surrounding the assassination attempt on Pope John Paul II in 1981. And uh, just because people are always calling me up and uh, asking what the music that we played was, I will tell you very quickly that the first musical break tonight, we started out with the OJs, of course, For the Love of Money. Great, great old song. Um, after that, we played the jam with Pretty Green, and uh, followed that up with, what was the third thing we played? Oh, the Paul Butterfield Band. Shake Your Money Maker. Shake Your Money Maker. This last break, uh, we started out with Elvis Costello watching The Detectives, uh, particularly appropriate as the uh, noose begins to tighten on Michele Sindona. After that, of course, we played the classic Money by Pink Floyd, and then followed that up with a, a kind of a weird little, but I felt highly appropriate song by an Italian band called Gruppo Sportivo called I Shot My Manager, and that was the one that ended with a gunshot noise at the end. Kaboom! And, of course, what we're talking about is Michele Sindona 
and uh, Michele Sedona and the bad straits that uh, the shark is going to fall into. And, of course, coming into the last segment here, uh, the last article that Dave read talked about after the, uh, the frustration of the, uh, the bond caper, the Vatican Bank bond caper, um, the counterfeit bonds to the tune of almost a billion dollars falling through um, a Mafia Vatican Sedona special, um, reputedly to be used to buy shares in Bastogi or Bastogi, um, a, a large congl Italian conglomerate, uh, Michele Sendona turned his eyes west across the oceans to the United States and bought into the Franklin National Bank. Again, uh, perhaps, as far as we can tell, not realizing uh, or perhaps arrogantly not caring that he was buying into a very, very sick bank. And, uh, in fact, as uh, the art last article ended, the people so sold it to Michele Sendona, went laughing all the way to the next bank that they bought with the funds. Now, again... Uh, so Sendona has bought the Franklin National Bank, a bank in serious trouble, but uh, Michele Sendona, nonplussed and uh, bloody but unbowed, is going to go ahead and, and, and plug along anyway as we're going to pick up the story here. Now, again, um, when you hear the shark referred to, they are talking about Michele Sendona. We're also going to hear references to uh, someone who in, in Italian would be called Il Cavalieri, um, that is the knight, as David Yallop is going to call him, K-N-I-G-H-T, and that is Roberto Calvi. Sendona's protege and himself also uh, in line to become the Vatican's most important banker after the fall of Sendona. Again, reading from In God's Name by David Yallop. While the knight, and yeah, that's Calvi, was busy embezzling millions of dollars to maintain fraudulently the share price of B Ambrosiano, that's the Banco Ambrosiano in Milan, the shark had been far from inactive. Sendona is like a character from a Pirandello play where all expectations may prove to be illusions. The man exudes theater. A fiction writer, however, would balk at such a creation. Only real life could create Michele Sindona. And uh, Nip Tuck speaking, I would insert parenthetically that uh, Robert Ludlum and Trevanian and all the rest of them could never have dreamed up um, the Mediterranean merry-go-round, folks. Being things this wild only happen in the real world. As those of you who have followed this broadcast and the one before it and stick with us to the end will find out there is nothing in, uh, in fiction that compares to this. Alicio Jelly continued to repay Sindona's commitment to P2. When the Milan Public Prosecutor's Office applied for Sindona's extradition in January 1975, the American authorities made a routine request for more information, including a photograph, and asked that, ex that the extradition papers be translated into English. The Milan office completed a new 200-page long request and sent it to the Ministry of Justice in Rome to be translated and sent to Washington. The ministry, however, eventually returned the request to Milan, claiming that it could not manage the translation. This was despite the fact that it has one of the largest translation departments in Italy. And the American embassy in Rome declared that it had no knowledge of the extradition request. Licio Gelli had friends in many places. Sindona, meanwhile, was living in his luxurious Hotel Pierre apartment in New York. He retained the Richard, John, Richard Nixon John Mitchell law firm to help him fight extradition. Questioned by reporters, Sindona claimed the charges were part of a conspiracy. Quote, The governor of the Bank of Italy and other members of the Italian establishment are plotting against me. I have never done a single foreign exchange contract in my life. My enemies in Italy have swindled me, and I hope that one day justice will be done. End quote. In September 1975, when photographs of a dinner-jacketed Sindona shaking hands with New York's Mayor Abraham Beam appeared in Italian newspapers, there was a cry of outrage from at least some quarters. Corriere della Sera observed, quote, Sindona continues to release statements and interviews and continues in his American exile refuge to frequent the jet set. The laws and mechanisms of extradition are not equal, not equal for all. Someone who steals apples can languish in prison for months, perhaps years. An emigrant working abroad who does not reply to his draft board is forced to come back and face the rigors of the military tribunal. For them, the twists and turns of the bureaucracy do not exist, unquote. In Italy, small savers, meaning small savers in the banks, appointed lawyers in an attempt to salvage some of their money from the Sindona wreckage, and the Vatican declared a, quote, serious budget deficit, unquote. In the United States, the shark hired a public relations man and went on the university lecture circuit. While senior executives of the Franklin National were being arrested and charged with conspiring to misapply millions of dollars by speculating on the foreign exchange, Sindona was telling students at the Wharton School of Finance and Commerce, quote, the aim, perhaps an ambitious one, of this brief talk is to contribute to restoring the faith of the United States in its economic, financial, and monetary sectors, 
and to remind it that the free world needs America. While he was being sentenced in his absence by a Milan court to three and a half years imprisonment, having been found guilty on 23 counts of misappropriating almost 14.5 billion lira, about $22.2 .2 million, he was busy moralizing to students at Columbia University, quote, when payments are made with the intent of evading the law in order to obtain unfair benefits, a public reaction is clearly called for. Both the corrupted and the corrupter should be punished. While he was planning the blackmail of his fellow P2 member and close friend Roberto Calvi, Sindona painted a visionary image to students who yearned to emulate him. Quote, I hope in the not-too-distant future, when we will have been in contact with other planets and new worlds in our myriad galaxies, the students of this university will be able to suggest to the companies they represent that they expand to the cosmos, creating, quote, cosmo corporations, which will bring the creative spirit of the private entrepreneur throughout the universe. And uh, again, a nip-tuck parenthesis here, just thinking about the idea of fascist banking spreading to the stars. Uh, the mind does boggle, doesn't it? Going along with Yallop's book. At about the same time, Sindona arranged a number of meetings between the American and Sicilian mafias and attempted to persuade them and Licio Gelli that they should organize the secession of Sicily from Italy. He had earlier, in 1972, been a conspirator in the so-called White Coup, a plot to take over Italy. The Mafia was skeptical, and Jelly was contemptuous. He called the idea, quote, mad, and told Sindona that secession of S Sicily could take place only with the support of the military and political members of P2, and that the members were biding their time. He advised Sindona, quote, put the plan in the pending file. Well, it doesn't sound like he felt it so mad, does it? Skipping along, uh, in September 1976, the Italian authorities finally succeeded in having Sindona arrested in New York. It was the first significant breakthrough they had achieved in the long fight for his extradition. Sedona expressed surprise that, quote, the United States chose now, some two years after these false charges were lodged against me in Italy, to begin these extraordinary proceedings. I want to emphasize that the charges were made in Italy on the basis of little or no investigation and on their face are false. He was released on $3 million bail, but by 1977 the net was finally beginning to close. A federal grand jury began investigating alleged violations by Sindona involving the collapse of the Franklin National. Sindona used all the weapons at his disposal. Important people went to court to speak for the shark as he fought extradition. Carmelo Spagnuolo, president of, the, of, the, of a division of the Supreme Court in Rome, swore in an affidavit that the charges against Sindona were a communist plot. He also swore that Sindona was a great protector of the working class that the people investigating Sindona in Italy were at best incompetent and were controlled by those with political motivations. For good measure, he advised the grand jury that many members of the Italian judiciary were left-wing extremists and that if Sindona were returned to Italy, he would be murdered. Carmelo Spagnolo was a member of P2. Licio Gelli also swore an affidavit on behalf of Sindona. Gelli noted that he himself had been accused of being, quote, a CIA agent, the chief of the Argentine death squad, a representative of the Portuguese Secret Service, the coordinator of the Greek, Chilean, and West German Secret Services, the chief of the International Movement of Underground Fascism, etc., unquote. He made no attempt to deny these various allegations, and he offered no evidence that all or any of them were ill-founded. He attributed them to, quote, the rise of communist power in Italy, unquote. On oath, he then went on to make a few allegations of his own, including, quote, communist influence has already reached certain sectors of the government, particularly the Ministry of Justice, where during the last five years there has been a political shift from the center toward the extreme left, unquote. Again, he offered no evidence. Jelly asserted that because of, quote, left-wing infiltration, Sindona would not receive a fair trial in Italy and probably would be murdered. That... Uh, well, never mind. We'll get back to that. He continued, quote, The communist hatred of Michele Sindona is due to the fact that he is an anti-communist and that he has always been favorable to the free enterprise system in a democratic Italy, unquote. Well, Licio Gelli was absolutely right that Michele Sindona was, had always been favorable to the free enterprise system in democratic Italy. Of course, it was a free enterprise system that Licio Gelli, Michele Sindona, Roberto Calvi, and apparently Archbishop Paul Marcinkus have manip uh, manipulated uh, to their own benefit and to the benefit of the fanatical anti-communist cause. And in fact, as we mentioned before, not even the anti-communist cause, purely for the political well-being 
of uh, themselves and their right-wing allies, and in many cases, in most cases, the financial well-being, and as Dave mentioned earlier in the broadcast, oftentimes anti-communism is merely a screen for either extreme fascism by itself or an extreme power lust of any kind or money lust. Now, one of the things to note about Sendona's situation is the uh, remarkable connections and the strings he was able to pull on this side of the Atlantic. Sendona is extremely well-connected, or was extremely well-connected, in the United States. We're going to be coming back to this at greater length in the next broadcast on the P2. Eventually, Sendona's financial empire collapsed in Italy, and that became known as Il Crac Sindona. Yallop writes about that as follows. Il Croc Sindona, the Italians called it. When it came... The collapse of the monument to greed and corruption that Sindona had erected was not unimpressive. He had talked grandly of not knowing what his personal wealth was, but he claimed it was in the neighborhood of $500 million. Sindona was a bit confused. <clears throat> the reality was somewhat different. But then a grasp of reality had never been one of the shark's strong points. His self-delusions had been fed by the illusions of others, as the meteoric pattern of his career shows. September of 1973... At the Waldorf Astoria in New York, the Prime Minister of Italy, Giulio Andreotti, rises to his feet at a luncheon and delivering a speech in praise of the shark hails him as the savior of the lira, unquote. January 1974, at the Grand Hotel in Rome, U.S. Ambassador John Volpe names the shark man of the year for 1973, unquote. March of 1974, prices on the Milan Stock Exchange are flying high, as is the exchange rate against the dollar at 825 lira. If Sindona were to close down the huge currency operations now, he would emerge with a profit of at least 100 billion lira. Anna Bonomi, a rival in the Milan financial world, makes an excellent offer for Sindona's holding in Immobiliari. Sindona refuses to sell. April of 1974, the stock market goes into decline and the exchange rate falls dramatically. This is the beginning of Il Croc Sindona. The Franklin National Bank in New York announces a net operating income for the first quarter of two, shares per, two cents per share compared with the previous year's 68 cents per share for the first quarter. Even this is a falsified figure. The reality is that the bank had suffered a $40 million loss. May of 1974. Franklin has the brakes put on its massive currency speculation. National Westminster of London objects to the volume of Franklin's clear, sterling clearings through its account. In the previous week, they have averaged 50 million pounds per day. Franklin now announces that it will not declare a quarterly dividend, the first time since the Depression that a major American bank has been forced to omit a payment to shareholders. The shark tells the board of Societa Generale Immobiliare that the balance sheet is the best in the company's history. July of 1974. The holes are showing both in Italy and in the United States. In an, in an attempt to fill the Italian hole, the shark merges Banca Unione and Banca Privata Finanziaria. He calls the new creation Banca Privata. Instead of two medium-sized sick banks, now he has one very large sick bank. Instead of two large holes, one gigantic hole is revealed, a 200 billion lira hole. August of 1974, it is time for the establishment to rally round. In Italy, Banco di Roma, having taken a large part of the Sindona Empire as collateral, sinks $128 million into Banca Privata in an attempt to fill the hole. In the United States, the government... Fearing that the collapse of Franklin National could have serious repercussions gives Franklin National unlimited access to federal funds. Over $2 billion flows from the Federal Reserve into the Franklin. September of 1974. Bank of Pravata goes into compulsory liquidation. Estimated losses are over $300 million. This includes $27 million of Vatican money plus their share of the bank. October 3rd. Licio Gelli repays a little of the huge investment that Sindona has made in P2. By courtesy of P2 members in the judi judiciary and the police force, Jelly is advised that Sindona will be arrested the following day. Jelly tips off Sindona. October 4th, an arrest warrant for Michele Sindona is issued. Sindona has fled the country. Ever a man of vision, he has previously changed his nationality. He is now a citizen of Switzerland. The boy from Sicily flies to his homeland in Geneva. October 8th, the Franklin National collapses. Losses to the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation two billion dollars. It is the biggest bank failure in American history. October 74 to January of 75, Europe resounds to the noise of crashing banks that are Sindona controlled or linked. Bankhaus Wolf AG of Hamburg, Bankhaus IK Herstadt of Cologne, Amencor Bank of Zurich, and Fina Bank of Geneva. With regard to Fina Bank, Swiss banking sources estimate Vatican losses at 240 million dollars. The Fina... Excuse me, the Fina Bank's losses on foreign exchange dealings alone are a minimum of 82 million dollars. The Italian authorities, or rather those of them not controlled by P2, 
were by now attempting to take active measures. Sindona, having eventually resurfaced in the United States, showed a marked disinclination to return to Italy. October of 1974 was the beginning of a long battle to extradite him. This battle was destined to have a direct influence on the ultimate fate of the then Patriarch of Venice, who at that time was preoccupied trying to raise money to help a group of mentally handicapped people. It would be difficult to find a greater contrast between two men than the values that separated Albino Luciani from the shark. Sindona's presence may have been urgently required in Italy, but inside the Vatican he had become persona non grata. As the Secretary of State, Cardinal Vio, V-I-L-L-O-T, brought Pope Paul news of each new aspect of the crack, His Holiness grew more distressed. It has been said that Pope Paul aspired to be the first poor pope in modern times. This is a fallacy. The divestment under Pope Paul of the majority of the Vatican's Italian holdings had but one aim, more profit. Prompted by the desire to avoid Italian taxes and obtain a lower profile in Italy, Vatican Incorporated had been seduced by Sindona and his clan with the prospect of greater wealth through investment in the United States, Switzerland, Germany, and other countries. The story that the Vatican would have one believe today is that Pope Paul alone was responsible for the Vatican's deep, nearly decade-long involvement with Michele Sindona. This is yet another Vatican fallacy. Significantly, it is one that never surfaced during Pope Paul's lifetime. Persuaded by his secretary, Monsignor Pascali Macchi, by his advisors Cardinal Gieri and Benedito Argentieri for the special administration, by his secretary of state Cardinal Vio, and by Umberto Ortolani that Sindona was the answer to the Vatican's prayers, the Pope undoubtedly opened the bronze doors to the shark and beckoned. Once inside, Sindona did not want for company. Indeed, the Pope might have been alerted if his advisors had exercised elementary caution. Close study of the events already described leads unavoidably to the conclusion that many within the Vatican walls were ready, willing, and eager to join in the criminal activities of Michele Sindona. Bishop Marchinkus was obliged to suffer the indignity of several sessions of intensive questioning by the Italian authorities about his personal and business relationship with Sindona. Marchinkus, who sat at the behest of Sindona and Roberto Calvi as a bank director in the tax haven of Nassau, Marchinkus, the close friend of Sindona. In April of 1973, when the U.S. investigators had asked Marchinkus about his dealings with Sindona, Marchinkus had said, quote, Michele and I are very good friends. We've known each other for several years. My financial dealings with him, however, have only been very limited. He is, you know, one of the wealthiest industrialists in Italy. He is well ahead of his time as far as financial matters are concerned. Less than two years later, in February of 1975, Bishop Marcinkus was asked a similar question by the Italian magazine L'Espresso. This time, his reply was, quote, The truth is that I don't even know Sindona. How can I have lost money because of him? The Vatican has not lost a cent. The rest is fantasy, unquote. For a bank president, Bishop Marcinkus constantly displayed an alarmingly poor memory with the U.S. investigators as well as with the Italian reporters. Far from being limited... His financial dealings with Sindona were large and continuous from the late 1960s until shortly before Il Croc Sindona in 1975. In 1971, Sindona had played a crucial role in Marchinkus' sale of Banca Cattolica, Banca Cattolica to, Robert, to Roberto Calvi for $46.5 million and had made an illegal $6.5 million kickback to Calvi and Marchinkus. This, like the later losses inflicted on the Vatican by Sindona, was far from fantasy, unquote. Dr. Luigi Menini... Secretary Inspector of the Vatican Bank was arrested as a result of the Sindona crash and his passport was withdrawn. Manini, who worked directly under Marchinkus, denied everything and knew nothing. Possibly one of his sons, Alessandro, who held a high executive position on the foreign affairs section of Banco Ambrosiano, the nerve center of much of the currency speculation, would have been equally mystified if questioned about the criminal activities of Sindona and Calvi. Continuing. Before he'll crack Sindona, Manini speculated... On behalf of the Vatican... Oh, excuse me. Before he'll crack Sindona, Menini speculated on behalf of the Vatican Bank in foreign currency, currencies alongside Sindona's colleague, Carlo Bordoni. Over the years, Bordoni got to know him well. Quote, Despite the fact that he acted like a prelate, he's, he's talking about Menini, he was a seasoned gambler. He tormented me in every sense of the word because he wanted to earn money in ever-increasing quantities. He speculated in Finabank, in shares, in commodities... I recall one day he gave me a short letter from Paul VI, which gave me his benediction for my work as consultant to the Holy See. Manini was virtually a slave to Sindona's blackmail. Sindona had often threatened to make public information about to make public information about Manini's illegal operations carried out with Finabank. Massimo Spada, administrative secretary to the Vatican Bank, 
again directly under Bishop Marchinkus, although officially retired from the bank in 1964, had continued to represent a wide cross-section of Vatican interests. Like Menini, Spada opened his front door one morning to find the Italian finance police there armed with search warrants. His personal bank accounts were frozen by court order. His passport was withdrawn. Three separate legal cases were started against him, all alleging a wide range of banking law violations and fraudulent bankruptcy. Spada, who according to Carlo Bordoni's sworn statement was another slave to Sindona's blackmail and who was fully acquainted with all of Sindona's illegal operations, expressed the classic Vatican Bank position when questioned by L'Espresso in February 1975. Quote, Who would have thought that Sindona was a madman? Spada asked. This man, who was a director of three of Sindona's banks, work for which he was very highly paid, continued, quote, In 45 years, I have never found myself in a situation of this kind. I have lived through the most difficult periods, but I have never seen anything like it. Raving lunatics started to buy billions of dollars with European currencies. All the losses come from that. Who could have known that every day Mr. Bordoni was selling 50 or 100 million dollars against Swiss francs or Dutch guilders? At the time Spada made these observations, he was considered, at the age of 70, to be so brilliant as a businessman that he was still on the board of directors of 35 companies. And so it went on. No one in Vatican Incorporated knew Sindona or anything about his criminal activities. The trusting men of God had been conned by the devil. Is it possible that they were indeed all honorable men who were betrayed by Michele Sindona? Is it possible that Vatican representatives such as Menini and Spada could sit on the boards of Sindona's banks and remain ignorant of the crimes Sindona and Bordoni were perpetrating? Massimo Spada gave the game away during his interview with L'Espresso. He was asked if it was indeed only Sindona and Bordoni who were guilty of currency speculation. Quote, You must be joking. You in Lugano, otherwise known as Sphero Bank. The Vatican Bank held the majority 51% share in the Swiss Bank. In Lugano otherwise known as Sphero Bank. The bank president was Prince Giulio Pacelli, the executive director, Luigi Menini. Like other Vatican-linked banks, Sphero Bank speculated with the funds that it held on behalf of the illegal exporters of Lira and members of the Italian Mafia. Gold and foreign exchange speculation was an everyday occurrence. In 1974, a hole began to appear. The person blamed was deputy manager Mario Tronconi, which is odd since the deals were transacted by Franco Ambrosio, another Sphero Bank employee. In the autumn of 1974, Mario Tronconi was, quote, suicided. His body was found on the Lugano Chiasso Railroad line. In his pocket was a farewell letter to his wife. Before his death, doubtless for the sake of tranquility, Pacelli, Menini, and the other Sphero Bank directors had obliged Tronconi to sign a confession in which he assumed full responsibility for the missing $35 million. No one denounced Ambrosio. Indeed, he was given the task of recovering the loss. The truth came to light only two years later when Mario Barone, one of Banco di Roma's joint chairman of the board, Banco, uh, Banco di Roma held a 40% share of Sphero Bank, was arrested and questioned in conjunction with Il Crack Sindona. Okay, basically... Notice the maneuvering that takes place once Il Croc Sindona comes down. Basically, a lot of people are heading for the hills, and uh, a couple of a couple of very quick uh, very quick notes. Uh, a, a lot of other people, I was going to say, are heading for, uh, for for slots about six feet under. Right. Well, that that that's the point I was just about to come to here is that uh, the unfortunate and late Mario Tronconi basically is the first of a lot of people we're going to take a look at who, uh, as soon as Il Croc Sindona appears. But basically, the uh, the mortuaries begin working overtime. Again, with regard to the P2, it's like a top 40 radio station. The hits just keep on coming. And now, uh, again, because this is something we're going to want to think about for all the remainder of the broadcast, um, it's a well-known it's, it's well aphorism, a truism even, that one lie begets another. Um, and, and, of course, the reason that is is that once you tell one lie, you have to tell other lies to cover up that lie, and then you have to lie to different people about different things, and you have to make all the lies try and match, and it makes it more and more. Um, this is obviously uh, in play here, but what is also true, as we have found out in the course of time doing this sort of political research, is that in these sort of large-scale operations, one murder tends to beget another. And what happens is that as um, some low-level... Um, financial person uh, or person involved in any kind of a plot or conspiracy or coup or whatever is bumped off, 
and the other people involved begin to fear for their lives. They begin looking for some kind of protection, knowing that they themselves are also expendable. They begin going to the authorities. More people are involved. More people have to be killed. And what we're going to see in this case, the P2, the Banco Ambrosiano, um, the Vatican Bank, and the whole thing spiraling on out, is that as more and more people um, uh, become frightened, more and more people have to be killed, and that not only that, but the, um, the authority and prestige of the people who become targets become greater and greater. And as we're talking about now, Mario Tronconi, a comparatively low-level operative in Sphero Bank, probably the first to go as far as this particular investigation. By the time we're done with this broadcast, we will see um, people like Michele Sindona, Roberto Calvi, and possibly, ultimately, John Paul II almost himself get it. So uh, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger, like something that you can't cover up. In the passage Nip just read you to, note the, the presence of Prince Giulio Pacelli on the board of Spiro Bank. That is that Prince Pacelli is one of, the, one of several brothers of... Eugenio Pacelli, later Pius XII, and Francesco Pacelli, who helped negotiate the Vatican Treaty. I think he's a nephew, actually. Anyway, uh, actually, a uh, well, nephew, whatever, a, a blood relative of Pacelli's, who, along with several other blood relatives, were play, was placed on the board of directors of a lot of the Vatican-related companies. Now, remember the uh, suiciding, as, uh, <laughs> as, as David Yala puts it, of Mario Tronconi, because we're going to take a look at a long series of corpses that begin turning up following Il Croc Sindona and in connection with all of the various Vatican <laughs> Bank machinations, uh, the Banco Ambrosiano failure, and as we'll see, with regard to all the political activities of P2, uh, the bodies begin piling up at a very, very quick rate. Returning now to In God's Name. Concerning the uh, Il Croc Sindona, it was apparent to all parties concerned with the forthcoming trial of Sindona that the evidence of Giorgio Ambrosoli was of paramount importance. I would interrupt here. Giorgio Ambrosoli was the court-appointed uh, investigator and liquidator of Sindona's banking empire. Beginning again, it was apparent to all parties concerned with the forthcoming trial of Sindona, uh, parties concerned with the forthcoming trial of Sindona, that the evidence of Giorgio Ambrosoli was of paramount importance. On June 9, 1979, the judge who had been appointed to try the Sindona case, Thomas Griesa, arranged for Ambrosoli to swear a deposition in Milan. By that date, the man who was given a $100,000 contract to kill Giorgio Ambrosoli had been in the Hotel Splendido, Milan, for 24 hours. He had checked in as Robert McGovern. He was also known as Billy the Exterminator, unquote. His real name is William Arico. At his first-class hotel near Milan Central Station, Arico dined with the five men who were to assist him with the murder. His two main accomplices were Charles Arico, his son, and Rocky Messina. Their weapons included an M11 machine gun, specially fitted with a silencer and five P38 revolvers. Arico hired a Fiat and began to stalk Ambrosoli. The request for a detailed statement from Ambrosoli had initially been made by Sindona's lawyers. They had hoped to demonstrate the absurdity of the charges with which their client stood accused in New York. Their awakening, which began on the morning of July 9th, was rude in the extreme. Drawing on his four years of work and over a 100,000 sheets of meticulously prepared notes, Ambrosoli quietly began to reveal the appalling truth in front of a cluster of American lawyers, two special marshals, marshals representing Judge Griesa and the Italian Judge Giovanni Galati. When the court adjourned after the first day's hearing, Sindona's lawyers could easily be identified as they left. They were the men with the worried faces. Oblivious of the fact that he was being followed, Ambrosoli went on to another meeting. This was with Boris Giuliano, the deputy superintendent of the Palermo Police Force and head of the city's CID. The subject was the same as the one on which Ambrosoli had been testifying all day, Michele Sindona. Giuseppe Di Cristina, a mafia enforcer employed by the families Gambino and Zerillo and Spatola, had been murdered in Palermo in May of 1978. On his body, Giuliano had discovered checks and other documents that indicated that Sindona had been recycling the proceeds from heroin sales through the Vatican Bank to his Amencor Bank in Switzerland. Having compared notes on their separate investigations, the two men agreed to have a fuller meeting once Ambrosoli had finished his testimony to the American lawyers. Later that day, Ambrosoli was again involved in business concerning Sindona. Ambrosoli had a long telephone conversation with Lieutenant Colonel Antonio Verisco, head of the security service in Rome. They discussed the object of Verisco's current investigation, P2. On July 10th, as his deposition continued, Ambrosoli dropped one of a large number of bombshells. Detailing how Banca Catolica del Veneto had changed hands and how Pacetti had been unloaded by Sindona to Calvi, Ambrosoli stated that Sindona had paid a, quote, brokerage fee of $6.5 million to a Milanese banker and an American bishop, unquote. On July 11th, 
Amprosoli completed his deposition. It was agreed that he would return the following day and sign the record of his sign the record of his testimony, and that the week after he would be available for questioning and clarification of his evidence by the U.S. Prose- prosecutors and Sedona's lawyers. Ambrosoli had a long day. By the time he got back to his apartment, it was nearly midnight. From the window, his wife waved. They were about to have a belated dinner. As Ambrosoli moved toward his door, Arico and two of his aides appeared from the shadows. The question came out of the darkness. Jojo Ambrosoli, si. Arico aimed at point-blank range, and at least four bullets from a P-38 entered the lawyer's chest. He died instantly. By 6 a.m., Arico was in Switzerland. A $100,000 sum had been transferred from a Sendona account at Calvi's Ban- Banca del Gotardo into an account Arico had under the name of Robert McGovern at the Credit Suisse in Geneva. The account number is 415851-22-1. On July 13, 1979, less than 48 hours after the murder of Giorgio Ambrosoli, Lieutenant Colonel Antonio Varisco was being driven in a white BMW along the Lungo Teveri Arnaldo de Brescia in Rome. It was 8.30 a.m. A white Fiat 128 pulled alongside. A sawed-off shotgun appeared through its window. Four shots were fired, and the lieutenant colonel and his chauffeur were dead. One hour later, the Red Brigades claimed responsibility, unquote. We're going to talk, interrupting, we're going to talk about the Red Brigades and what, which side of the fence they're really playing in the next show. Continuing with Yallop's account, on July 21st, 1979, Boris Giuliano went into the Luke's Bar on the Via Francesco Paolo di Biesi in, in Palermo for a morning coffee. The time was 8.05 a.m. Having drunk his coffee, he moved toward the cash register to pay. A man approached and fired six shots into Giuliano. The cafe was crowded at the time. Subsequent police questioning established that no one had seen anything. No one had heard anything. Boris Giuliano's position was taken by Giuseppe Impalomeni a member of P2. So the court-appointed liquidator of Sindona's empire shot down by a man named William Errico. We're going to see what happened to William Errico later in the broadcast. After that, and Lieutenant Colonel Antonio Varisco, who is investigating P2 and confers with Ambrosoli, he is murdered within 48 hours of Ambrosoli, and the Palermo police chief, Boris Giuliano, who is also conferring with Ambrosoli about Sindona and his heroin traffic on behalf of the mafia, is murdered eight days after Varisco. So... Again, the, the hits just keep on coming, and the bodies begin piling up as the liquidation or planned liquidation of Sindona's empire uh, it, it, it basically gets underway. Along with the liquidation of the empire, quite a few people are obviously being liquidated as well. Now, speaking of bodies piling up, we're actually going to find out now in a short short uh, footnote from In God's Name what happened to William Arico, the man who shot uh, Giorgio Ambrosoli. And down at the bottom here of this page... Yallop is written on February 19th, 1984, William Arico fell to his death while trying to escape from the Metropolitan Correctional Center, Metropolitan Correctional Center in New York City. Arico and Michele Sindona were due to face an extradition hearing two days later. The Italian authorities wanted to put both men on trial for the murder of Giorgio Ambrosoli. So, even our self-confessed uh, death count here is already at five. We, we, we can't even bother to try and keep the count because in the, in the next couple of weeks, uh, the death count is just going to go spiraling upwards into the tens, twenties, and eventually probably the hundreds, and we don't even know the half of them, actually. And uh, one, of the, one of the people whose bodies eventually was to be stacked on the heap was none other than Michele Sindona himself. And uh, as a matter of fact, Michele joined the hit list this past spring.